too. Welcome to Mind, Body, and Soul Awakening, a show where we celebrate resilience and inspire transformation. Our guests share their stories of how they overcame a traumedy and turned it into a triumph. I am your host, Stars Tita. Get excited and let's have some fun. I'm super fantastic. I'm grateful. I'm hopeful. And I'm thankful. How are you, Stars? I am feeling amazing. I am so excited about this episode. And if this is your first time, welcome, welcome, welcome to the Mind, Body, and Soul Awakening Show. I am Stars Tina, your host. And this is PJ, my co-host. And this is our last episode of this season. So we're feeling really good. And this is an episode that we have been working on the whole season. (laughs) Because the very first episode, remember you had the idea and we've just been searching. Tell tell us about that idea. How did you come up with this idea, PJ? Well, you know, I used to do a show. It was called Tom Ford Fridays with men uh, panel. And we talked about things that men uh, need to talk about in during our emotional, enlarging our emotional intelligence. (laughs) And so I thought about, you know, there's a myth, Stars, that when a person has been married more than once, that they're a person that you don't want to take marriage advice from. And I processed that. I used to be that person. And then as a person who I've been doing marital and premarital counseling, coaching uh, for over a decade, and I processed that one day and said, it doesn't make sense because the more experience that we have, the more actualized that we come, the closer we get to being the better version of ourselves, the more we know. And so if you've had two or three marriages, unless you have a mental issue that you're, you're not dealing with, then those people who have evolved at whatever matters they're in now, they're the better version of themselves and they know what they didn't know going into their first or second marriage. Hold on. PJ, are you saying that a woman should be looking for a man who's been married two or three times? Is that what I hear you saying? Now this is where (laughs) effective communication comes in. (laughs) And I like the fact that you clarified, that's a version of saying what I heard you say, you just said, PJ, are you saying? That's not what I'm saying at all, Stars. What I'm saying is, is that we need to process each situation for itself, rather than to get into generalities and say, okay, he's been married three times, he's off my list. (laughs) Well, you may be getting the very best version and thankful for the other three women that allowed him to learn to be the man that he's gonna be for you. And vice versa, same thing for the women. So I'm just gonna say potato, patata, tomato, tomato, because it sounds like you said the same thing, like we should be looking for men that have been married more than once, but I could- That's not, that's what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that we, you shouldn't shun a man just because he's been married. So then what we should, would you say that a man who's been divorced a few times, I'm not going to say is better, but is a good candidate for a woman? It depends on the individual. We can't put everybody in the same You're box. A politician, because, you know Come on. Happens? Now, <laughs> well, it, you're in the mind and body soul awakening show. So when a person has stayed on the hamster wheel and they uh-huh. keep choosing the same type of person, keep going through the same type of issues. No, you don't want to marry that person, male or female, but a person that as you question them, you find that they have evolved. They have become more actualized as time has gone. They've learned from their mistakes. They can tell you, well, I used to be like this and that was all my fault. And I realized Uh it was my fault. Uh And now I've changed that and I've grown. 
I love uh, it. At, I love it. At this point, my first marriage was a prophylite marriage in a church that was really a bunch of root workers under the disguise of being a church. <laughs> I was engaged to a young lady that they prophylite and said, that's not your wife. So I didn't marry her. And my first wife, who's deceased now, we didn't know each other a good seven days before we were married. So a person then, when I married my second wife, my wife that I'm married to now, if somebody says, well, if you've been married before, I don't want to marry you. Well, they would have missed out on a really, really good thing. Yes. And yeah. Me and my wife now, I have learned so much in the last 33 years. How long have you been married? 33 years? 33 years. I have wow. learned so much about PJ. I love it. And it's changed so much that if something was to happen, a, a woman would get the best version of me that I've ever been. Oh, I love it. It sounds like this is going to be a great episode for men and women. At first, I thought it was just great for the women because they could learn about the men. But it seems like men can learn from men with experience. So I'm super excited about that. What about you? I'm super excited as well. I've got to so tell the ladies to call up their girlfriends, their <laughs> sisters, their aunties, their nieces, because we're going to talk about, first of all, why men divorce. And then I'm going to give seven tips for those who are married, how to keep their husband. Ooh. You, let me tell you this, stars. So women need to know how to keep their husbands because there's a whole group of women out there that are after your husband and don't care that you're married. In this case, you didn't know it, ladies. You can't get complacent. There's a bunch of women waiting to step in your shoes. I love it. Okay, so ladies, I'm gonna bring our guests to the table. Are you ready? Are you ready? If you're watching, you're gonna see two very, now I didn't even ask if they're available. I think they're single. They've been divorced twice. I'm bringing in the first person right now. His name is Rudy LaRoffs. Did I say your last name correct, Rudy? I guess if I hey. unmuted him, that would help. Yeah. <laughs> Say just that again. Like Rose, just like the word Rose. The Rose. There you go. That is so beautiful. So, ladies, thank the you, thank, you, thank you, thank you. Are you, are you single, Rudy? I am single. I'm happily divorced. Yes, I am. Happily divorced. <laughs> and and where do you live? I live in Florida, actually. Oh, he's in Florida. I don't know if this is true, but I heard he's coming to my event. If you know, December sixteenth. 14, 15, 16, I'm having an event in Orlando, Florida. But ladies, yes. I'm gonna let Rudy tell you a little bit about him, himself and his business, and uh, why we chose you today, Rudy. Go for it. First of all, Rudy LaRose in the building. I'm in the building of life and a life and legacy well lived. Thank you, thank you so much for inviting me to this wonderful and amazing topic. Uh, so important. Listen, never mind who I am. The, 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 the fact of the matter is I'm here, I'm present, and I'm present to knowing that I matter. There's a reason why I'm here. There's a reason why I'm able to, to live and move and breathe. And God has given me the ability to just say that I just love my life. I absolutely do. And I'm thankful to be in the field of technology for the last 20 plus some years. I'm just helping small businesses all over the world, all over the, the country, the state, the city, wherever we are, wherever you are, to remotely be able to take care of their computers and the networks and the servers and all the great things. And as importantly, my life work is just to mentor, just to be a voice of hope and, and inspiration, and just to say, if I can do it, this young, vibrant man from a little small place called Port-au-Prince, Haiti, if I can do it, so can you. So our other guest is from Haiti as well, so Sapase! Naboule! <laughs> what does Sapase mean, by the way? That means, what's up? That's all it means. What's up? What's up? What's up? What's up? What's up? Right, so Sapase, here comes our next guest. He was our guest on here a couple weeks ago, but he's been divorced. He's, he says he's got a PhD. Make the noise. Give it up for her. And you forgot to say you were an author, Rudy. You didn't tell us a little I bit. I am an author. Yes, yes. So I have a book called Seven Steps to Unstoppable Confidence on Amazon. And if you are an entrepreneurial man, listen, if you're an entrepreneurial man and you need to take the lid off, what is the lid? You feel lonely, you feel isolated, and you feel like you don't matter. 
I mean, you're making the money, you've got the family, you've got the car, you've got the house, but somehow you're still feeling like there's a lid on you. You, you don't have that confidence to, to be able to move forward in your family and your faith and your, and your legacy. You need to grab this book. I love that topic of lid. Can you tell us lid again? <laughs> L-I-D -I is you feeling lonely, you feel isolated, and you feel like you don't matter. Right. And we focus in the book. We talk about what we call the riches, uh, relationship, income, community involvement, health, education and spirituality. Ooh, sounds like a book I got to get. I will definitely be getting that. Thank you. OK. And I actually met Rudy on a clubhouse. If you guys are uh, BWC Breakfast with Champions, I talk about it all the time. You know, yeah. your vibe is your tribe. And I heard you speak and I. I what you were talking about was really good, but the thing that popped for me was when you said you were married two times or more, and I know that mm. we were searching for that. And then yes. I saw you on a speech contest, and I was just like, okay, this is a man who wants to progress. This is a man who wants to elevate his business. So I'm yes. so excited about that. <clears throat> All right, Will and Will, Will Baptiste. Will just came out with a book. Will, now guys, if you've ever seen the TV show, uh, Cosby Show, He's the lookalike for this person, Malcolm Jamal Warner. Yeah. Looks, Hello. Hello. Are you single, Will? I am single and ready to mingle. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I am. No, no. But let, let, let me let me put that out there. I am spiritually, mentally, psychologically divorced, but I am not legally divorced. It's been four years. We're not going to get into it. Can um, we stop right there for a second? Can we stop right there for a second? Okay, because men kill me when they don't say certain things, but mm. I think that's a lie. See how I love the fact that you said I'm single, but I'm not divorced, but you're divorced. Do you understand? Because you'll have someone, they'll say something, they won't tell you something, for example. Yep. Are you ready? Yep. This, I was going out with this guy. We were together for like two or three years. We went to a wedding, and the day of this person's wedding, he looks at them and he says, why didn't you ask someone who's married about marriage? I'm like, you're married? You never told me that. <laughs> now, he wasn't with her for like seven or eight years, but he never told me. So, Will, mm. thank you for that. Yeah, yeah. but I think, I think it's important um, because I have followers, because I have people that I, that I work with, and I get, at any given time, they were like, oh, okay, I thought, you know, she was gone. She's been five, she's been MIE for almost five years and try to get a hold of her and all that kind of stuff. And it's that happening. So there's a lot of things to it. But I know in the back of my mind that that mentally, spiritually, psychologically, I had nothing to do with this woman. But legally, if I wanted to get married tomorrow, I couldn't. So I think it's important. And that's where emotional intelligence and being vulnerable and being honest. And I got an acronym. It's called HOT. Uh, honest, open, and transparent. And I think it's very important. Honest, open, and transparent. I think it's very important for men to do that because we got another generation that's coming after us. We have to model that, hey, listen, man, this is what it is. I am proud of it. I made some missteps. I don't call them mistakes. And this is where I'm at in my life. You know what I'm saying? And I thank God for that as well because maybe I would have jumped into another relationship that I wasn't ready for. So there's always a reason, you know, there's always a reason for that. So that's why, that's where I'm at. So, but I, I love when I say, La Rose, he's from um, Port-au-Prince and I'm from Lekai. Cause oh, I mean, wow. there, there wants to be a rivalry between Port-au-Prince and Lekai, <laughs> but I am the true Haitian sensation. So you oh, here we go. Me. Here we go. That's on my book. <laughs> that's on my book. It says that, that Haitian sensation. I actually grew up in Florida as well. I grew up in uh, Naples, Florida, where I went to school. Oh, wow. uh, and I've been in Canada now, in Montreal, for the past 18 years. So uh, I might as well go ahead and introduce myself. My name is Will Baptiste. Of course, you know me as the Haitian sensation. I am a, uh, uh, I'm a father of four, two bo beautiful girls and two boys. Um, and I serve single dads and, and busy husbands uh, to get unstuck from emotional suppression, what I like to call, a.k.a., emotional constipation. And the reason why I got into this field, I mean, I've had over 26 years in the fitness industry. I'm a retired uh, a firefighter and a first responder. And I had 10 years in the financial industry. And five years ago, when it, my whole world collapsed, when I came home and my second wife just walked out the door. Why? Because I came to understand the AAA effect, which is awareness, acceptance, and action. So when I became aware of who I am and whose I am and what I'm here 
for, and that's when my eyes open up and seeing the manipulation, seeing the the, the verbal and, and, and the emotional abuse and, and all everything that's going on. And God literally removed me from this toxic marriage. And now today I'm using my mess as my message. I'm using my test as my testimony. And today I went from a disaster to master and I'm using my story to impact history. And that's what I'm here to do. So hey, listen, I, I am I, I am pumped. I don't know if you can tell, but I am pumped. I can tell. I'm ready I can tell. to get this Let's conversation go. going on. Let's go. Before Pastor Jeff hops on, I'm going to see if I can squeeze a question in because this season he's just taken over, Ruby. He makes me like go in the back corner, but I'm going to jump in real quick. Trauma, tragedy. So as you know, my book just came out, No More Traumedy. A traumedy is when the energies of a trauma and a tragedy collide. When these two energies come together, life-changing experiences occur. And this podcast is when people come through and share their trauma and how they got over it. Would you say, and I'll let you go first, Rudy, and then you can go, Will, would you say that getting divorced once, getting divorced twice, was that some type of trauma? And if so, how did you get over it? We'd love to know. Oh, definitely was. Definitely was. And interestingly enough, the first time, I didn't get it. It's like, oh, it was bad. It was bad marriage, blah, blah, blah. The second time around, I said, yeah, I think I got it this time. I need some help. I need, I, I don't need, and, and here's what was important for me. And I'm going to say this live on camera. I did not need marital help. I didn't. And the reason why I didn't need marital help is because I cared about getting married. I cared about being married. I cared about the person that I was with. I needed mental, emotional uh, health because it was about me. I Can was the issue. A second. So am I hearing you correct that in your marriage, you're saying the marriage, you didn't need couple therapy. You didn't need marriage therapy. You needed therapy for yourself. Is that what I'm hearing? That's right. That is absolutely correct. That is absolutely correct. Because, because <laughs> I see you will, because the tendency, and I'm going to talk about my background as a church boy growing up, you know, I've seen uh, come and go, uh, grew up a uh, mom who was a single mother, uh, not being able to see an example of a healthy relationship in my life. Um, but understanding from, from young, I always wanted to be married. I kid you not. I remember seeing my friend who was married already. He had, you know, a couple of kids and his wife coming. I'm like, I want that. I, I had appreciate it because I saw it on my friend's life. I saw it in other people's life. So like marriage for me was like, okay, it's normal. You meet a girl, you, you date, you do the thing, you know, the, the whole courting thing. You like her, you confirm, this is the person for me, you get married. Like, I believed in that. But fundamentally, there was a broken seven, eight, nine-year-old that was coming into a relationship thinking that he could be a husband. And I couldn't because I couldn't be Rudy. I didn't know who Rudy was. So I went into I went into a relationship broken and I continued this brokenness in both relationships until I said, you know what? I had enough. I need to figure this out. I need to go back, go back to the root of it all before relationships, before I, I even knew what relationship was and look at the pattern, look at the root of what in my mind constitute being a husband a husband, a, 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 um, a leader of a home, uh, a lover, um, but as importantly, a man. What did, did it, what, did, what did it mean for me to be a man? So that was my journey. So yes, there's absolutely a lot of trauma involved in, uh, in dealing with that. I just went to a, 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 a therapist and I kid you not, that was the best decision of my life. Now, before I throw it over to Will, because Will, it's an add-on question, because you said your whole life or most of your life you wanted to be married. Would you say that's a Haitian thing? Because I don't know too many American black men that are itching to get married. <laughs> um, I don't think it was a Haitian thing more than it was. You know what I saw? I, I So here's the thing. I'm, a, I'm very community-oriented. Friends, family. Um, I, I grew up in a pretty large family. So I saw... The, the people that were the most happiest, honestly, were people that were married in good marriages. 
So I, I enjoyed that. Whenever I'd go to a friend's house and the dad was there and the mom was there and the kids were, you know, the dad was playing with the, the kids or the mom was whatever. And there was, there was a synergy going on. Something about that told me that is what I, I like. That makes sense to me. That There's wholeness to that, right? Um, or if I saw it in a family member. And then the flip side of that is when I didn't see it, I saw, I saw a disconnect. And so, so for me, it was, it was being able to see both sides of the spectrum and saying, you know what, I, I'm not the whole player type. I don't need two or three women. I really would like to establish my home. I really would like to, to, to experience that for me because I've never seen it in my own home, but yet I knew that that's what, that's what a, 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 a strong uh, uh, bond looks like is to be able to have that, that person in your life. I love it. I love it. Okay, well, trauma, tra traumedy, uh, with the divorce. Is it true? Is it real? And then is the Haitian thing a, a thing? You gotta unmute yourself. Yes. Um I, I think you spoke so loudly, so profound. Uh my light that was on top of my camera just dropped. Okay. So listen, that's what that's why I look a little darker, but I'm good. I'm good. Man, everything you just said, um, I could just build up on that. Um, I don't know if it's a Haitian thing, but I've always wanted to get married. As a matter of fact, before I got married, I never, I never lived with my wife, my, my first wife before we got married. And for me, you know, it's, it's always, is it has always been, and I've never seen anybody married. My mother wasn't married. Uh, my father was, you know, was a Rolling Stone, whatever, wherever he, he laid his head was his home and being a gyne gynecologist as well. But anyway, that's a whole nother story for another time. But for me, marriage, and I think, you know, from a church background, right? I think it was probably the, 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 the one of the best and, 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 and oldest institution that was created by God. And I think everything comes from that, right? If you want to see a marriage, if you want to see a family flourish, if you want to see a business flourish, because, because marriage shows some type of foundation of everything else that you can build on, right? So I got married the first time, and unfortunately, I got caught up in my business. I got caught up in the success. I was working hard for the family at the expense of the family. So, and that's the reason why my 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 coaching program is to run single dads and busy husbands. But there's a reason I say that because what I found out from my experience. 90% of high functioning men and men with high status all working hard, not from a place of, of, of from a pure place or from a place of fulfillment or contentment. It's from a place of trauma. I'm hiding something, so therefore I gotta work hard to mask because I don't want to deal with the dead bones inside of me. I don't want to deal with my trauma. And as you said, Rudy, I was that nine-year-old boy. That was a nine year old boy, right? That was sexually abused. Now, I was introduced to, to love via sex, thinking that if a woman give me love, if a woman give me sex, that she loves me, right? So, that nine year old boy got into a marriage thinking this is what love is all about. It's about giving me sex. And I wasn't getting that, right? And then, so I started working. I started, you know, try to, try to forget about something. But that nine-year-old boy that, that was never healed got into this relationship broken, got into this relationship with a lot of trauma, got into the relationship, not even even know who he was. As a matter of fact, I said, both of my wives, unfortunately, I lied to both of them. And people say, how could you say that? Of course I lied to them. I didn't even know who I was. So I'm telling them who I think I am. So now they're treating me based on what I said. And then when I found out, when I realized that my soul was bucking away because the way they were treating me, my soul didn't like that. And I'm like, why are you treating me this way? Well, this is who you told me you are. So I had to go back and heal that little boy. And when I, in my book, I said, when the boy is healed, the man will appear. Right? When the boy is healed, the man will appear. And then it took me two marriages to finally realize there is no such thing as problem in a marriage. I'm going to tell you, I'm gonna, you know, you, you can go take that to the bank. 
there is no problem in the marriage. There is no problem in relationship. But I'll tell you what, 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 what it is. People with problems that enter into marriage. And they say, well, the marriage has problem. No, honey. No, brother. They, there's no problem in the marriage itself or the relationship itself isn't the problem. The problem is the problem. The problem is just, just because we both fit together doesn't mean I can take, look at this. I can take this bottle. It could be broken. I can take the lid. It could be cracked. They still fit together. Now, tell me what's the problem. Why do they fit together? A lot of times, two broken people fit together. They think they're compatible. But all the while, they are operating from a dysfunctional. So they're bonding over their dysfunction. They're bonding over the trauma, thinking that it's compatibility. No, it ain't compatibility. You're just bonding over trauma. So I think what it is is, you know, especially as, as a, and I always say it, as a black man, as a black man from the island, for us to be able to talk about this in the open, man, Jesus is about to come. Because that's something that I've never seen. I, I never even think I about it. that would have come. So, I mean, I as you can see, I'm very passionate about this. Why? Because I want to pave the way for the next generation, for my sons to understand that, listen, there are a lot of things that you're going to be attracted to. But know who you are first. Because when you know who you are, you can walk into every room. No matter where it's at, you can stand up on your own. And no matter how, how many beautiful women are pulling them, your, themselves at you, you can say, no, that ain't me. Because I have, I'm the one that's going to set the standard. I'm yes. the one that's going to qualify that woman. That woman has her qualities, but I'm the qualifier. Yes, yes. She, she may have qualities, but she's not, she's not, she's not you know, she, her qualities don't meet my requirements. Okay. She, her qualities don't meet my requirements. So because I'm the qualifier, she's good for somebody else. Let's keep it moving. I love it. Rudy, it looks like you're taking notes over there. Do you have something you want to spit out? I, see I, you I always I always take notes, uh, uh, Tina. I'm a student of life. And, and I wanted to add on to what uh, Will said about, you know, this not being talked about. So imagine, if you will, as island black men right um there is there is there is a difference in growing up in an island versus you know growing up in america and i would probably venture to say it is a plague in the black community as a whole um for especially for black men when it comes to relationships and be able to have a conversation right um i i, I don't i can't even remember remotely remember Either myself or any of my friends. Did we lose her? I can't hear you, Will. I said, she's coming back. We're good. We're oh. good. I'm just looking for my phone to turn it off so it stops ringing. That's the phone. <laughs> it's all good. Uh, yeah. So I can't even remember or remotely remember as, you know, a young teenager having even a conversation about relationship with a man. Nonetheless, a father figure like that's 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 unheard of. Like that's crazy to think that, but it, it was it just didn't happen because we didn't talk about you know whatever went down. We didn't talk about the fact that the man came home every day, but he had two, two or three other women. Those things weren't talked about, right? I was a father of I'm sorry, I was a child of a man who was already married, right? So so we obviously didn't talk about that. We didn't talk about those things. So when Will says how imperative it is for us to have these conversations and to be honest about what, what happens when we don't talk about that. It, it, for me, it's a game changer and I wouldn't change a thing except for the fact that now I'm changing that we are having these conversations. We are talking about the brokenness that we go into these relationships and the brokenness that we cause around us. Um, one of my favorite saying is, when you are inauthentic with who you are, it puts you and everyone around you in danger Ooh. because you continue in this pattern of, of, of living this life. And Will said it earlier. He said, I was, I was lying to them, but I didn't know. And honestly, sometimes you don't even realize you're lying because to you, it's the truth because that's all you know, right? That's all you know until, until you sit down 
you slow down, you eat, you reevaluate what you know, and you reevaluate who you are, and you reevaluate what's important to you, and you re you reevaluate why you've made the decisions that you've made. Both relationships going into them, I knew I wasn't supposed to be there. I knew that. You could <laughs> listen. I I could tell you times. I could tell you dates. I could tell you going into a second marriage, and I was still seeing someone a week before we got we went down the aisle. That should have been a red flag. <laughs> I so talking about red flags. That should have been uh, a red flag for me. Yeah. But here's what I said to myself. Well, you know, if I end this relationship and I go and I get married, then that'll fix it. Right? That'll fix the loneliness that I'm dealing with. That'll fix the 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 desire to the the, the desire to connect with someone, right? That that'll fix the desire to have somebody I can I can really, you know, be myself around. That'll fix it. You can't fix, Will said it earlier, you cannot fix a boy, right, by putting him in a man's position. That doesn't, that's, that's not how it works. And, and, and sometimes we think, well, let me just push them into the water and he'll learn how to swim. But here's what happens with that. If there's other people in the water with you, what do you, what do you think happens when, they, when somebody's drowning? You know what the first thing they tell you to do? Do not touch them if they're not calm because they will take you down with them. Do not, if they're going like this and uh, help me, help me, don't touch them until they're calm because they will take you down with them. So until you realize certain things, until you learn, until you sit down and you, you really decide to like, you know what? I need to find me. I need to understand me. I need to do the work. What's so the work? We, Explain to that for those men oh, that are wow. listening to now and they're like, what is he talking about? Do the great, work. Great, great, great. So do the work looks like this. First things first, be honest with yourself. If you're not ready to get married, then don't. If you're not ready okay, to be with that. Again, honest to be married. Some men want to get married so they have someone to sleep with, someone to cook, someone to come but see, home to. But okay, so, so let me go deeper. Let me go deeper. If you're not ready to be 100% honest with the person that you're going to be with, then don't. Because, because, because the first act of going into a relationship, it's transparency, it's vulnerability, it's the, it's the things that, that you would never say to anybody else. Until you're willing to do that with that person, slow it down. I'm not saying don't talk. I'm not saying don't be friends. I'm not saying don't, don't go out on dates or whatever. But if you're not willing to really face yourself, right? Because here's another thing that people don't understand about marriage. When you go into a marriage, when you go into a relationship, nonetheless a marriage, even just a relationship aspect, you know what you're doing? You're saying, hey, uh, can you put a mirror to me uh, every day, please? Whenever we talk, can you just put a mirror so I can really see who I am? That's what you're doing. That's what you, women, that's what you guys do. You are a perfect mirror for us. You are a perfect mirror for us. And until you're willing to face that mirror, don't even bother. Because it'll get you frustrated. It'll get you, it'll get you all kinds of tripped up ways. It'll get you going from one mirror to the next mirror to the next mirror, trying to figure out what's wrong with the mirror. Ain't nothing wrong with the mirror. Yeah. <laughs> so Ain't Will, wrong with the mirror. I hear you. I hear you. Will, what would you say? He said red flags. What are some things that women can see in a man? Do you think women can see things and she's like, eh, he's not marriage material or he, I should leave him or not go out with him. Do you guys have any tips for women like that? And then we'll go to uh, Rudy. Okay. So, so what a woman would see in a man that she should be like, eh, no, don't. Listen, first of all, I, I'm not a fan of red flags. And I think you and I talk about this before. I don't wait for red flags. Take this, Rudy. You ready for this? I look for yellow signs. Because before I get the red sign, I want to see the yellow sign. Because, I mean, listen, before the light turn red, it turn yellow. So it's just constant, okay? If you get to yellow, because by the time you get to, red, to, to, to the red flag, it's going to be so red, it's going to be, it's going to be pink. And now you got all your feelings mixed up. No, don't wait for the red flag. Number one. Number two, dating is collecting data. Okay? Let's just put it out there. Because a lot of times people are dating and they're all sleeping with each other. No. 
dating is collecting data. That's why when you are dating, you got to date with purpose because your hard drive, which is your mind, can only collect so much data. So you should be going on so many dates, right? You're collecting data. And then once you find the one that's qualified or pre-qualified, and then now you're going into what we call the courtship. Now, t- tell me about your testimony. Tell me about the work. You know, now, now let's get in deep because now you have proved to me that you have some type of level of, of emotional intelligence. Now, let me play the devil's advocate now. You say, what would a man look for in a woman? First of all, Ask him about his childhood. Can he talk about his childhood? Can he talk about the relationship or lack thereof with the father or the mother? Because that would indicate what kind of man that you're going to be dealing with. Because he may still be, like Rudy said, a little boy and a body of a man. What kind of relationship? Now, I'm not saying to, to throw the baby out with a bathwater and say, oh, well, that's, kind of, that, that, that's your... No, if he can articulate that, I don't care if he's been in prison five times. Hello, that's me, right? I don't think I don't care if he's been molested. Yes, that's me from 16 to 17. I don't care if he's been uh, sexually abused. That's me from the age of nine to 16 or uh, 15. Those are all the things that I've been through. Fair marriages, fair businesses. But you see how I can articulate it? Now you see how I can talk about it? Not crying like a baby, not playing like a victim? Now that's an emotional intelligent man. If a man cannot articulate what he's been through and what he's doing to make sure that he better himself, run. Run. Because that's not a man that is ready. Doesn't mean he's a bad person. But that's not a man. If Now, now the thing is, in order for that woman to understand and to see that, she's got to have done the work. So unfortunately... We got people that are not doing the work, but expecting to have somebody that's already starting the work. So what's the equilibrium? What's the balance? Because it takes one to so, so you got to be if, if we're both blind, then we, we're gonna lead each other, right? But I think it's very important for a man, and I still believe that you know, women and men, we all equal as human beings. But we're not equal when it comes to function. So I don't want to alienate or, or push away your audience. But this is what Will believes. Does it mean Star Cena or uh, Rudy believe that? I believe we're all equal as human beings. But when it comes to function, we are not equal. Because I can't have babies. But I can protect you. I can provide for you. I can make sure you're good. You understand what I'm saying? So we all have our function. So I think it's for men. So I cannot ask a woman anything that I'm not willing to do or anything that I'm not willing to, uh, to, to model. Right. So for me as a man, I got to set the the pace. I got to set the standard because if I know who I am, there's certain women I'm not going to even entertain. Why am I entertaining this woman? I'm not a savior. I'm not going to play the savior. Right. So, again, and that goes both ways for men and women. But the problem we have in this world, I must say. Men, men are horny and women are lonely. Let me say that again. Men are horny, women are lonely. You put them both together, you get a disaster. No wonder the, the marriage, percentage marriage, you know, divorce is skyrocketing because of people are not building that friendship. People are not building that foundation first, and they got nothing. You know, a house with no foundation, you know what's going to happen. Now, because I'm planning on building a skyscraper, I'm planning on building a huge mansion, so I got to spend more time now in the foundation because I know what I'm about to build. It's going to be huge. It's going to be big. So the foundation got to be solid. I love it. Pastor Jeff, PJ, what are you thinking of these conversations? I am absolutely loving them. I feel like I'm getting so much information here. You got to unmute yourself. Oh, I got to unmute you. Sorry. Tell us what you think. What's going on? I'm, I'm loving the conversations. And as Rudy would know, technology is wonderful when it works. And it's awful when it doesn't. Rudy, I've got a new Ozbot. Tiny two, it's less than 60 days old. It's got a mind of his own. I've been going back and forth with the um, tech support for over a week, but you know, I wouldn't give up. I'm here and we pray now that it, it'll operate fine. And so gentlemen, I'm loving these conversations. I'm the only one that's not Haitian, so that's okay. Don't hold it against me. I'm loving the conversation. Uh, it's not often that I get to talk to a lot of men, 
who have emotional intelligence. And as we talk about marriage more than once and understanding what I love what you said, Rudy, is that the marital counseling would not have done you any good because you needed individual personal counseling. And more men need to come to that realization is that we need to fix each other. I mean, we need to get ourselves fixed before we're prepared to go into a relationship with someone else. And that woman needs to have herself fixed. Uh, but what Will said is when you get two toxic people in a relationship, they become yep. codependent That's on right. one another. That's and right. Neither of them really grow because they're just used to dealing with the toxicity. And as we talk about marriage more than once, what ends up happening, gentlemen, is that if you're if you haven't gotten yourself together in that first that first relationship, you take that toxicity out and you go you look for somebody mm -hmm. that's going to be toxic because that's, that's all you right. know. You look not, for another mirror. You look for another you mirror. People with normal, you, <laughs> right. you you need somebody that that you can bounce back off with. And unfortunately, those type of marriages going over and over again mm -hmm. don't last. They don't do either of the people good. But what I was sharing yep. with stars before you came on is that as we grow, as we actualize, become actualized ourselves, according to Maslow, as we each day become a better version of ourselves mm -hmm. and we learn, then we become a better husband a better man, a better father for the next woman. That's right. When we're doing the work. That's and right. That's when this myth of, well, if 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 they've been married more than once, I don't want to take any advice from them. I, I think that is ludicrous. That's 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 like talking to a doctor and saying, well, he's been a doctor for 20 years. But if he's lost more than two patients, I don't want him to. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> it, it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't make sense. But yeah. I have some things, uh, a couple of points that I want to 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 share with you, gentlemen, to see what you think about it. And the first is why men divorce. I, I came up in my research, came up with a few reasons. One of the reasons was necessity. The second reason is incompatibility. Third reading is infidelity. And it's interesting. I think the women need to hear why infidelity was not at the top of the list for, for men, while I think more men will uh, divorce for infidelity than women will. Ineffective communication. And then as you talked about, Rudy, personal issues, whether that be mental issues, physical issues, financial issues, just, just personal stuff. I ain't got me together yet. So, Jim, I'd uh, like to go to you first, Rudy. Uh, again, your thoughts on why men divorce. Uh, and if you want to add something into it, but we looked at necessity. Uh, you, 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 you got to it. So maybe an abusive relationship. And mm -hmm. it may be that the other person is not going to change. And for your peace, before you kill yourself, you have to. But uh, necessity, incompatibility, mm -hmm. infidelity. Ineffective mm -hmm. communication. We just can't. We, we can't get it together. And personal issues. What's your thoughts, Rudy? So, um, in order for me to answer that, we we also have to talk about why do the why do they get married, right? Because there is this this concept of you know if everything lines up. I'll give you a perfect example. I remember the first girl that I, I actually um, asked, or I was about to ask her an engagement. Um, and went to my pastor at the time, I was probably 22, 23. Um, and he said, eh, I don't think it's the right time, brother. And he, you know, he had his reasons or whatever, had the ring and everything. And the reason why I was going to ask her is because I've been in the church. She's been in the church. She comes to church. She, you know, everything kind of lined up. It's like, oh, okay, she's this, she's that, whatever. And you know, we, we seem to get along and have a great relationship. We, we stayed abstinent and we did, we did all the things. We did add all the check marks, right? Mm -hmm. And from, in my mind, I was thinking, well, that's the formula, right? You, 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 you pass the formula. And whether you go to church or not, that's what I, you know, that's, that was my experience. 
And a lot of times we, I go, I would go into relationship thinking that I, it's just got to have all the check marks. Like everything's got to check because if it checks, then this is the person. And I think what, the, what happens through that, through that false narrative is that you go into a relationship with that in mind and you divorce way before the paper is actually signed. Mm-hmm. Well, I was talking about spiritual divorce earlier. That divorce happens way before. Why? Because that, that engagement that you took on, that, uh, that, that whether you signed a paper or whether you, you, know, you did it out of church or you went to the courthouse, however you decided to do it, but you went into it thinking one thing. You went into it understanding this contract you went into completely false. And so as a result, you go along and you find out, wait a minute, I thought that, but I thought that, but I thought, and you realize sooner or later that you in you in a, a, contra- a contractual uh, a demise, if you will, that you have no business being in, none whatsoever. And so for me, I think a lot of men divorce, at least for me, in my perspective, is because when we when we when we find ourselves not aligned whether it's uh sexually whether it's physically whether it's monetarily emotionally uh, spiritually in a relationship with someone we as men we we don't even know how to function i didn't know how to function pastor jeff i got to a point where i went into a depression because for me it's like well everything checked out why is it that i'm not able to to connect with this person why is it that i'm looking for connection outside of my relationship when that wasn't my mo to begin with what what is happening with me that's causing me not to be able to connect with this person i'm with every single day and so and so you we have to like i said go back to the beginning of entering that commitment first and see why you got to a point where you're like man this is this is not good and so would you call that, that would would you call that unrealistic expectations or what would you call that um i will i will call it i don't want to say that it's unrealistic because to me and to whoever is going through it it's very real right it's a very real expectation i i think it's more it could be unmet but it it could also be un, un it could also be expectation that you just didn't understand you had Right? You just didn't know. It wasn't that it was, you just didn't know you had them. You just didn't know there was a need for that. And oftentimes by the time you figure that out, it's too late. You, you cheated or you, you disconnected or you uh, gambled your life away or you got, you know, you went into drinking binge or you, like Will said, you put all your, your life into your work. And then so you, you know, you ostracize yourself from your family. A number of things happens in, in, the, mid, in the middle of that. I want to come. I want to come back to that because I want to get uh, some more clarity on that. Uh, but I want to go over to Will for a moment and ask Will, what's what's your thoughts on uh, these reasons that men divorce? Necessity, incompatibility, infidelity, ineffective communication, and personal issues, whether that be health, uh, mental, uh, financial, or other personal issues. Yes, but 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 I want to say the reason why a man would ask for divorce. Seventy percent of the time, the men Get, ended up getting divorced is because it was initiated by the woman. Because there's a study that shows that seventy percent of the marriage, uh, seventy of the yeah, divorce, we we, are, we 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 we've got those statistics. And what right, we want right. to focus on here is when men divorce, and that's what's going to help the women. The women already know about the women. The seventy percent of them that file for divorce, that thirty percent of men who file for divorce. Yeah, but 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 in, in my case, in the men that I've worked with. Uh, and the number one thing, and, and I find it fascinating, is infidelity on the women's part that I found out. And number two was, now check this out, because there's a difference, what I've learned. There is a difference between intimacy and, and, and sex, because a man intimacy Ooh. versus a woman intimacy is different. At least for me, intimacy for me is me being vulnerable. That's intimacy to, to me. So... What I found out is a lot of times we come with an expectation. There we go. The expectation that now I am married, then I'm supposed to be, you know, having sex five times a day. That's because we never talk about this in the premarital counseling. 
how sexual active are you? And I know that I've been sexually active since I was nine. And that's something I'm working on. And I had to go see my doctor, making sure that I don't have any type of problem or addicted to it. But I'm 43 and I've been working out for 16 years. When you work out and you're active, and as a former bodybuilder, it activated a lot of things. Your testosterone is to the roof. I'm 43. I am well, more me, now than me, I haven't been before. I understand that. And, and we need to have another show because, I, I mean, we, we do a whole show on intimacy and <laughs> the difference between having sex and intimacy and how that is defined between a man and a woman because it's absolutely defined different. But as we talk about divorce, I, I want to come back to, to the, and y'all find I'm like a pit bull. I want to come back to the topic. The topic is when that 30% of men divorce, you, you mentioned that the number one reason for the men that you've talked to was infidelity. Rudy, what do you think about that? Um, I think it's, I think I, I could totally see that. Um, and here's what's interesting about that. Um, even in the face of infidelity, as a man for me and as the leader of the home, I would still say it's my fault. I would still say it's my fault. And the reason why is because most women, not all, but most women will not just get married just to be in, be uh, uh, commit adultery, right? Um, most women get emotionally attached and then they'll, they'll go into infidelity. Um, and a lot of times as a man, if you don't, if you're not emotionally connected to the woman, she will go out. She, she may not necessarily go out to look for that, but she'll get in the situation where it would be pro that emotional security, that emotional uh, um, um, connection, if you will, will get formulated at work or somewhere else. And that's what will cause them to be to have, you know, infidelity in, 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 in their part. So even the wanna, fact that. I want to come. Go ahead. With, without looking at the reason that mm -hmm. women committed infidelity. Mm -hmm. I want to come to a notion that in, in, in the time frame that I've been doing what I do uh, with, with couples is a reoccurring phrase that I hear is she's damaged goods. Mm. And for a man, for, for the majority of these, these, these men that, that fit in this 30% of, mm -hmm. of, of those who file for divorce, mm -hmm. That's what they tell me. She's damaged goods. Mm -hmm. I want to challenge that idea because this is a reoccurring idea that we hear. I want to challenge it. And it has to do with understanding emotional intelligence and going deeper down into that wheel of feelings. And so what I asked the men is this. Were you a virgin when you got married? Was she a virgin when you married her? In most cases, the answer is no to both. So then I asked the question, okay, so if she if she wasn't a virgin when you married her, that means she was damaged goods when you married her. And if, if she was good enough to be damaged goods when you married her, why is she not good enough to be damaged goods and you stay with her? Gentlemen, tell me, what do you think about that? Will, you want to go first? Yeah, as my time is coming to an end. Um, okay. It's just, it's, it's, it's a lack of awareness because mm -hmm. when you looked at her you saw her body but you were you didn't take the time to look past the body and look at the mind so now all of a sudden what you thought was going to what 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 makes you so it's one thing to attain a woman but it's quite another to retain a woman so the body you will you will draw to that woman but her mind, her mind is what's going to allow you to keep the, this woman. But you should have known from the, from the well, beginning. Well, well I, I, I want to I come back to the men. I don't want to talk about the women right now. I want to talk about how the man feels when a man says a woman is damaged goods. Let's just talk about man's emotion, man's feelings. When that man says that woman is damaged goods, but he married her knowing that 
by his own definition, she was damaged goods. What's going on with that man? Again, a lack of self-awareness, lack of, 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 of having some type of standard. Because if she was, if it was damaged good, good enough for you to marry her, why all of a sudden she's no longer that? That's because you went into it with the a perception or with a mindset of, okay, she's good enough because of what I'm seeing on the outside. And now when I got the time to 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 dig deeper and see for who she is, and all of a sudden now I'm labeling her as damaged good. That's an excuse, by the way. That's an excuse for you to draw back from that marriage because she was damaged good when you met her. Now she's not good enough because now you figure out exactly that what you thought she was, she's not all that. So you know what I'm saying? So so, what would you say was going on inside the guy? What what's, well, again, what's the emotions? What's the emotions that he's not he's he's not aware of? What's what's really going on with him? Well, he's not aware of his own standard. He's not aware of who he is as a man and what he wants. You know, there is a such thing as called a needs and wants, uh, negotiables and non-negotiables, and you got to know that. You got to know them. So he has not done the work to know exactly what he's looking for, but he's being led by what he sees and not by what he feels in the, in, in the sense of what goes on with his, his own uh, standard. So again, we are so focused on the out, outer shell as a man because we are very visual, but along with that visual aspect of that woman, we got to do a better job. Because again, what LaRose said, it's on us because we are the one that's going out to hunt, right? We are hunters by, by, by nature. So we are the one that's making the first move that we have to decide where we're gonna go to make that move and to secure that woman to say, okay, come high, hell or high water, come thin to thin, I'm sticking by you because that's who you are. So we got to ask questions. We're not asking let's, enough let's, questions. Let's let's go to Rudy. Rudy, what's from your perspective, what's going on in that man's head uh, as it relates to him understanding emotional intelligence when he says she's damaged goods, but she was damaged goods by his definition right. when he married her? I think uh, um, to answer that question properly, I'll, I'll have to go to a very important part of my my journey. Um, I remember before I, uh, when I finally made a decision that I needed to see someone, uh, just to have a conversation about me. And one of the first thing um, she asked me, she said, what was it? What did you see um, in your mom's relationship with men? And when I explained to her what I saw growing up, uh, my mother was successful. She um, she was at the top of her food chain uh, when it came to work and and things like that. Provided her own home. You know, we had a we had our she looked she had her own home and things like that. So I grew up with her always having, you know, whatever we needed, if you will. And so when the men would come into her life, they would actually move in into our house and. For the most part, I saw her taking care of them all the time. And when I started telling her what I saw, um, she said, do you think perhaps you're living your life now as you saw your mom live your life and just tears just start pouring down my eyes? Mm. I said, oh my gosh, I'm my mother, right? Um, and so to answer your question is to say that many, many men, um, define what they see only by what they've been taught um, and what they've taken from their, uh, from what they, from what they grew up with, what they grew up seeing, um, what they grew up hearing, if you will. Um, and if I, if I'm going into a relationship with a woman, the way that I'm going to envision that woman is based a lot of times on my mom or my grandmother or my aunt or whoever that has that, that whoever you define, you see is that. I remember having a conversation with a gentleman, this was crazy to me, uh, where he would bring women to his house and his mom would give him kudos for that. It's like, oh yeah, you got another one. His mother would say that to him. And so no wonder he still to this day, years later, going through women, because that's that's the image that he has in his mind. And so, what you see is damaged good a lot of times is what you you've experienced in your upbringing with somebody else until 
you learn something different until you come to understand something different. And unfortunately, uh, PJ, um, we are growing up more and more as men, not having a mantle passed down to us to say, this is what you need to look for, son. These are the questions that you need to ask. These are the, the, the responsible things to do as adult is to be able to sit down and have a conversation, not have sex every day, not watch movies, not Netflix and chill, have conversations. Let me tell you something. As a young man, I, rem- I never forgot this. I was probably about 21, 22. I just got my own place. I had this girl that I really liked. She lived in Canada, of all places, in Toronto. And we used to talk all the time. My cell phone bill was crazy back then because it was long distance. It was AT&T. But here's what I learned from that experience. I never got as close to someone as I got to her because of the conversations that we used to have all the time. We have to stop it right there. (laughs) We have to stop it right there. PJ, I don't know about you, but it feels like we didn't even touch the iceberg with these conversations. We we have not. (laughs) This is why why we need these conversations with men, especially when men are willing to talk. Right. And, oh, and here's oh. one more thing too, PJ, I'll say, here's one more thing. One last thing I'll say too, is that because of these conversations, it now, te- it now taught me, or it should have, but again, I wasn't working on me. I was just learning. I was just doing things that felt natural. But what I, what I, what I, now, as I look back, what I learned from that is that the intimacy that I was going into, that's going from from physic, from emotional, from connection wise, from spiritual, if you're playing with that person, to physical, now is that that that's, that's that the progression. A, that's not a tone that men like stopping. <laughs> I'm screaming over here. This is fire. All right. If you are listening, I don't know when we're doing this again, PJ, but we got to get these guys back. This is like, I feel this was the best episode we did all season. And that's probably why it was so hard to get it together. Because literally everyone who's listening, it was like, I was like, what yeah. is going on? But we got it together. So Rudy, thank you. Will, thank you. PJ, thank you. We are out of here and we're going to have to do it again. Sound like a plan? Absolutely. Sounds like a plan, Stan. Absolutely. Peace in a bottle of hair grease. Bye. Bye. Bye.